I received a review copy of Meeples and Monsters from the publisher, and all other featured games were purchased at retail. Level up your Meeple warriors, enhance their skills, and pit them against progressively challenging beasts in the bag-building strategy game Meeples and Monsters. Collect point-scoring sets of cards in the simple drafting game Point Salad. Each card can be used for the vegetable showing on its face, or the scoring criteria showing on its rear. So grab the veggies you love, and avoid the negative scoring icky ones. Create a bustling seaside scene in the tableau building game Santa Monica. Gather tourists, citizens and VIPs, and guide them to their favourite beach activities to score victory points. Three engaging hooks from publisher AEG, but how do they hold up as commercial products? I'm Adam Porter, I design games and I review them on this channel with a particular focus on product design. Three years ago, publisher AEG announced that they were radically changing their business model. Their earlier approach saw them producing up to 20 new games each year, and some of these achieved great success. Smash Up, Love Letter and Thunderstone were front runners, perennial bestsellers with a host of expansions, sequels and new additions. All three are really fun games which stand up well, but my favourite games from AEG are actually two of their little forgotten titles, Dice Heist and Light and Dark. Both of these unassuming little games were co-designed by Trevor Benjamin, who went on to co-design one of AEG's more recent hits, War Chest. But AEG's new mantra in 2019 was produce fewer games. And that's a bold move when we know that many hobby gamers are avid collectors, constantly on the lookout for the next big thing. We also know that the old scattergun approach really works. AEG had some big hits with their previous model. Mystic Veil was one of the most exciting new products from the company back in 2016. A deck building game with transparent plastic sheets, which could be stacked and sleeved to create unique cards for each game. AEG declared that from 2019 onwards, they would be focusing on the products which excited them the most, the ones with the strongest chance of finding a large audience. And some of the games would shift to Kickstarter, while others would be super streamlined and made really accessible for a massive audience. Tiny Towns made a splash in 2019, a bingo-esque pattern building game where players create their own little townscapes. It quickly became a classic and expansions rapidly followed. Calico picked up the baton in 2020, an attractive, brain-burning puzzle with lots of cute cats. A few months earlier, AEG had sold one of its biggest hits, Love Letter, to Asmodee. But the company was rapidly creating new evergreen titles to fill the gap. Cascadia followed in 2021, another puzzly game in a similar vein to Calico, and this one rapidly hit the Board Game Geek Top 100 and took the number one spot on the Abstract Games list, as well as receiving a nomination for the prestigious Spiel des Jahres Award in 2022. But has this new approach resulted in successful commercial products across the board? For this video, I've selected three wildly different games from the AEG catalogue, all born out of this new era of fewer games. Santa Monica, Point Salad and Meeples and Monsters are diverse, not just in their gameplay and presentation, but also in their quality. In Point Salad, players collect vegetable cards and point cards which award positive or negative victory points for having certain vegetables at the game end. Three draw piles are set up on the table, with two vegetable cards beneath them. The back of the vegetable cards function as point cards. And on your turn, you take either one point card from the top of any of the draw piles, or any two veggie cards, which you add to your personal display. You then refill the central market, and the next player takes their turn. When all cards have been distributed, the players add up their scores from the points cards, and the highest scorer wins. In Meeples and Monsters, each player has a bag of differently coloured meeples. They start off with just white peasants, which are only really useful for building stuff, and grey corruption meeples, which are good for nothing. Later in the game, players will add yellow mages, red clerics, blue warriors, and black knights to their bags. And at the start of your turn, you draw a handful of meeples from your bag, and then you assign them to the board to take various different actions building locations and gaining rewards, or visiting locations to activate abilities, powering up the rest of your party, or swapping one coloured meeple for another. Alternatively, you can send a group of meeples to fight a monster if they're strong enough. 
defeated monsters provide victory points and more power-ups. You can also increase the level of each of your meeple types by spending victory points. And eventually, in the final turns of the game, your meeples will be strong enough to take on the big, powerful endgame bosses, which give big victory point rewards. Ultimately, victory points come from defeating monsters and completing quest objective cards throughout the game. And the highest scorer wins. In Santa Monica, you're trying to create the most appealing seafront in Southern California. Each turn, you're going to select a feature card from the display to build up either your top row beach or your bottom row street. And when you place your card, it might give you a bonus, some tourists perhaps, or residents, or it might allow you to move some of your people to a new location, or to gain some sand dollars, which can later be spent to use special abilities which are different in every game. If you select a card with the food truck beneath it, then you gain an additional sand dollar, and then you move the truck. And if you select a card with the foodie token beneath, then you can move a person on your display. And if you select a card with both the truck and the foodie, then you gain two sand dollars, or you can move two people. And when the VIP token moves from your starting tile, you leave a footprint behind. At the end of the game, you're going to score points for the footprints depending on the requirement of your starting tile. You also score for having people in the activity rings, placing certain cards adjacent to other cards, forming chains of matching card types, or fulfilling the requirements of an objective card which was chosen at the start of the game. The game ends when one player has placed their 14th card and the highest scorer wins. Our first contact with a game is often seeing the box cover and the title. So let's start with those names. Santa Monica, Point Salad, Meeples and Monsters. With Santa Monica, AEG has taken the well-worn approach of picking an as yet unused city and naming the game after it. It worked for Carcassonne, San Juan, and AEG's own Istanbul. It's not my favourite approach. As a geography dunce, these names mean little to me, so I'm totally reliant on the game art to sell me the theme. That said, Santa Monica has a very strong beachy vibe. It feels like a vibrant coastal city, so I don't begrudge it the vanilla title too much. Point Salad and Meeples and Monsters both have something in common. They give a little wink to hobby gamers. Gaming jargon creeps into board game titles from time to time, and it's always a turn-off for me. I've got nothing against the word meeple, in fact I think it's cute, but its inclusion in a game's title always feels heavy-handed. Meeple Circus, Meeple War, Meeple Land, Terror in Meeple City. Who are we trying to appeal to? The initiated. And I don't think the word meeple is enough to drive anyone away, it's just that the majority of your potential customers don't know what you're talking about. Scratch that, it, it does push me away. I can't make a rational case for this, it just feels naff. Now I don't have a stronger reaction to the title Point Salad. It's a play on gamer slang for a game which offers up points at every turn, regardless of the choices a player makes. I don't love it, but at least it's a descriptive term. Newcomers to the hobby aren't going to be left scratching their heads when they see a game with a cabbage on it with the title Point Salad, any more than they are when they see the title Sushi Go. So this brings us to the cover art. Jeremy Nguyen's Santa Monica artwork is sublime with its muted colours, humour and clarity. It's transportive. You can almost hear the seagulls. This is a game with atmosphere. The framing and composition of the image are immaculate, and the bird's eye view gives the whole thing a breezy feel, which accurately captures the feeling of play in the game. Point Salad is much starker. The veggies are stylized and gaudy, recalling the icons from a fruit machine. Now, I don't know whether this aesthetic is a, a deliberate nod to slot machines, but it works. Both Point Salad and the One-Armed Bandit offer up extremely simple gameplay focused around pushing your luck to gather sets of icons in order to maximise your rewards. Now, I don't find Point Salad attractive, but I do get it. Clarity over personality. Let the gameplay speak for itself. The Meeples and Monsters cover art is odd. The cartoon warriors are adequately drawn, but they have a weird coloured outline around them. And it took me longer than I'd like to admit to Twig that these weird little characters are supposed to be meeples. And the word meeple is written right there on the cover. Frankly, a meeple has one defining feature, its shape. Deviate from that and you're left with a gingerbread man. And these characters, these enemies, they're not even consistent. Some of them have this outline, some of them don't. It's baffling. Every box cover makes a promise. 
I ran the box cover of Meeples and Monsters past a gamer friend who had never heard of the game. I wanted to see what he thought the game might be like from the box cover alone. Silly, he said. Chaotic and humorous. Not to be taken seriously. So I'm not alone. That's what I took from it too. But the game isn't silly or humorous. In fact, it's really dry. There's lots of maths and min-maxing. And it isn't the least bit chaotic with its regimented turn order and deterministic combat. The broken promises extend to the game board too. Meeples and Monsters has all the trappings of a worker placement game. Place these workers here to gain this, but it lacks the most interesting feature of that genre, action space blocking. In this game, you simply spend meeples to purchase other meeples, victory points or cards, as you might in any number of other deck building or bag building games. It's not that there's anything inherently wrong with the iconography or graphic design, it's just that it sets expectations which are never met. The first few turns of the game are a process of recalibration, unlearning what you thought you knew from other games. Onboarding describes all the steps which lead someone to become an active user of a product. The cover and title are part of this process, but marketing, reputation and word of mouth drive interest too. Point Salad came out the gate running. A series of strong showings at international trade fairs and conventions generated a lot of buzz. I tried to pick up a copy at Essen Spiel in 2019, only to find it had sold out, and scarcity made me want it more. Santa Monica was a slower burn. An online recommendation, a couple of reviews, and the beautiful cover all played their part in driving my purchase. Meeples and Monsters took a different approach. This was a Kickstarter project, and it looks to have been moderately successful with approaching 4,000 backers. I'm sure the designer, Ole Steinus, has many fans. His earlier game, Champions of Midgard, was a big hit, and bag building is currently on trend, with Quacks of Quedlinburg riding high as one of the new classic gateway games. The version of Meeples and Monsters that I have is the retail version, but it has Kickstarter written all over it. The rules reference promo items which I don't have access to. The components represented in the rulebook look different to those in my set. The rulebook makes it clear there exists a lavishly illustrated edition of the game with screen printed meeples and exclusive modes of play that I don't have access to. I found it strangely alienating to have all this stuff paraded in front of me. The rulebook is perhaps the most important element in an onboarding process. If a player can't make it through the rules, the game will go back on the shelf and may remain there on the shelf of shame for years to come. How many games get a second chance? Equally importantly, the rules need to be clear, unambiguous and complete. If a player plays incorrectly, it might sour their first experience and the game will rapidly find its way onto the trade pile. The rule set for Point Salad is so slight, there's very little scope for getting it wrong. I was up and playing in no time. This is one of the most intuitive games around. For this genre of set collection card game, I always champion Sushi Go as best in class. But Point Salad gives Walker Harding's famous game a run for its money. The card drafting mechanism is a, a minor shuffle up in complexity, but the scoring system in AEG's game is even easier than Sushi Go. Santa Monica is considerably more complex, as you'd imagine from a big box game. But it's still a very approachable game, and the rules are clear and well written. I had no problem getting up and running, and no difficulty teaching the game. Meeples and Monsters once again disappoints. This rulebook is weak. It frequently repeats information, which sometimes makes it seem like you're supposed to repeat an action, which is actually an action that's only supposed to be carried out once. And then it misses out other information entirely, leaving you to search out the designer's intent on online forums. And then there's the typos and some straight up errors. It's not a total disaster. I got the game set up and walked through a few turns solo before introducing others to the game. And ultimately, we didn't have too many problems playing, but it could all do with a bit of a refresh. Of course, the most important bit of a customer journey is actually playing the game. Now I rate games between zero and three in five different categories, and their combined score climbs them up my engagement ladder. 10 points tops the ladder and indicates a real favorite with me. For thematic immersion, Point Salad scores zero. It's an abstract exercise in set collection. Santa Monica scores two. I love moving those little meeples around the seafront to get them to their favorite activities and watching my tableau grow into something unique and vibrant. Meeples and Monsters scores one. It's really nice to see your meeples leveling up and becoming more powerful, but the theme isn't helped by the lack of artwork on the buildings and quests. And the story never really comes through outside of the monster battles, which are entirely deterministic and mathematical. For interaction, 
Point Salad scores three. You're constantly getting in each other's way, and much of the scoring is based around having the most or least of certain items. Santa Monica gets one. The interaction is essentially accidental, taking a card your opponent wants without realising. Meeples and Monsters barely gets a one. The main interaction here is racing to defeat the most valuable monsters. And then there's a strange little King of the Hill location where you can place a worker to receive victory points on your next turn, but only if another player hasn't already taken that spot in the meantime, bumping you off. Stress and tension is high in Point Salad. There are certain veggies that you really need, and they tend to crop up at just the wrong time. You find yourself willing your opponent not to take them, only to see them snatched up, leaving you with horrid veggies that you don't need. Santa Monica is a more relaxing affair. Meeples and monsters never really become stressful. Your powers ramp up throughout the game, and the monsters, well, they always feel easy to beat. Feedback is the sense that a game is talking back to you, responding to your actions and giving you stuff. Point Salad could only ever really give you cards, but you do get plenty, and they build up nicely. Santa Monica gives great feedback. You gain coins to spend, visitors, cards, and importantly, the stuff you gain really impacts on your future turns. That nice little beach volleyball court is the perfect spot for my tourists. Meeples and Monsters does well in this category. It is extremely generous in its rewards. By the final turns of the game, you will have amassed an enormous pile of meeples of various colours, loads of power-ups which combo in exciting ways, and killing monsters which previously seemed impossible has become a breeze. Finally, for meaningful choices, Point Salad scores one. It's a light game with a lot of luck involved. Santa Monica gets two. There are plenty of nice decisions to make. And Meeples and Monsters gets a two as well. Pulling meeples blindly from a bag does result in some unlucky wasted turns, but generally there are opportunities for clever play, largely focused around efficient use of the game engine. So the final scores, Point Salad 8, Santa Monica 9, Meeples and Monsters 8. But there is a caveat in my system, where I deduct points when a game gets in the way of itself. Fiddly components, badly written rules, and failing to meet expectations are three of my most common criticisms, and Meeple and Monsters has all three. This really hampers my engagement with the game, so I'm deducting three points, giving the game a pretty mediocre five points. Point Salad and Santa Monica have a very healthy eight and nine points respectively, and this lifts them high on my engagement ladder without reaching the very top rung. Really solid games without quite making it into my all-time favourites. So moving on to my product design checklist. Are these games innovative? Well, frankly, none of these games feel innovative. They all use familiar mechanisms in a new way. And that's not a criticism. I'm a big advocate of iteration over forced innovation. Do they fulfil a need? Well, I think Point Salad wins out here. While Santa Monica and Meeples and Monsters could easily get lost in the ocean of similar titles, Point Salad really is one of the most effective examples of its genre. It's a memorable experience, and there are very few games which play so smoothly. We always need more super accessible games, but especially ones with interesting gameplay and choices. Point Salad achieves this balance really well. So we'll finish off by charting the three games on my idea execution matrix. The most successful commercial products have an outstanding central concept coupled with magnificent execution, both from the game designer and the publisher. Point Salad is a great idea executed very effectively. I'd like to see a more attractive presentation, and I don't love the title, but it's a great product overall. Santa Monica is a good idea. Personally, I've enjoyed it a lot, but I don't see the theme or mechanics pulling in a huge audience. The execution is lovely, though. It's a really slick product, and a game that I highly recommend. Meeples and Monsters has a nice central concept. Bag building with workers which can be upgraded, then used to fight monsters of escalating difficulty. As hooks go, it's not mind-blowing, but it's solid. The execution lets the game down enormously, though. The title, the artwork, the retail components, the rulebook, the fiddly pieces, the repetitive gameplay. It just doesn't come together into a satisfying package. Now, I haven't had a bad time playing it, and I would play it again, but it's not one that I'd reach for often. 
I don't see it achieving the word of mouth necessary to sustain a successful post-Kickstarter second life in retail stores. Now I found it really fascinating to watch AEG rework their business model and to monitor the results. Since they made the change, they've produced some of their biggest hits of recent years. But even with increased rigour and focus, there's still the odd misfire. Nonetheless, in 2022, a new release from AEG automatically has my attention. And that's not the case for many publishers. They're doing a lot of things very right. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please watch some of my others on my channel. There's loads of videos on there about board game design, loads of reviews. Please subscribe to the channel. Please comment. I love it when people comment and we can get into little back and forth. That's my favourite bit. And hopefully I'll see you on the next video. All the best.